This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. And straight ahead on the program, the cavalcade of earnings continues on Wall Street, and we take a deep dive into two closely watched companies. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Stephen Carroll in London, where we're taking the temperature of the European oil and gas industry as we head into another week of big name earnings reports. I'm Doug Prisoner, looking at what the Lunar New Year festivities will mean for the Chinese economy. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the business news you need to wrap up your week. Available on Apple, Spotify, the Bloomberg Business app, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby, and we begin today's program with the world's biggest media company, Disney, reporting earnings this Wednesday. And boy, there's a lot to unpack there. Production still catching up from last year's twin Hollywood strikes. What to do about the ABC network and other non-core units. Unprofitable streaming TV services. Activist investor Nelson Peltz's proxy battle with Disney's board. News that it's selling off most of its Indian broadcasting unit. And a real setback in Disney's feud with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis over control of the municipal district in Florida that includes the Cash Cow theme park. Disney World. It's a lot. And for answers, we turn to Geetha Raghunathan, U.S. media analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. And Geetha, what is the headline? That's a lot. But what do you expect to see in Disney's second quarter earnings report? Yeah, Disney is a very, very complex story, Tom, as you pointed out. Um, And I think, you know, what we're really looking to see, there's no one specific catalyst per se. But I think the sentiment for this stock has definitely turned. And there's, there's, there's a variety of factors at play here. I think you have uh, some really positive commentary coming out from them in terms of cost cutting. We are seeing margin improvement and we're seeing improved profitability at the streaming business. Now, remember that there's still losses going on there, but they're better uh, or, or they're, they're less bad than feared. Um, and I think the one thing that really kind of stood out uh, and, and has investors kind of excited going into fiscal 2024 was their free cash flow guidance. And they're guiding to a whopping $8 billion in free cash flow, which kind of takes them back to pre-pandemic levels and, and really supports the stock. And that is good news. I mean, streaming, I, I know they've been counting on several properties, including ESPN, Hulu, Disney Plus, but uh, it's not all good news, is it, for Disney? Not at all. Um, There are a lot of challenges that remain, uh, and and you alluded to this just a short while ago, in terms of at least the linear TV networks, uh, you know, that there is secular pressure on that part of the business. Um, They are looking to, uh, you know, uh, dispose of some of the networks, and I think that's, that's the right thing that they're doing, especially as far as their India unit is concerned. But they have to kind of articulate a much better strategy for some of their U.S. properties, uh, the most um, famous of them, of course, being ESPN. Now, this is, uh, you know, the, uh, the juggernaut when it comes to sports networks in the U.S., but it is a cash cow. It generates about $3 billion in EBITDA. But there has to be a clear strategy from Disney in terms of the future of ESPN and, and how and when it goes over the top. Now, also, there was talk uh, last time I think we spoke about Byron Allen making a $10 billion bid for the ABC network. Now, that was obviously turned down. But is there any movement in the selling of that, what is now a non-core business for Disney? It is definitely a non-core business for Disney. But actually, after, uh, you know, there was initially some chatter about Disney maybe wanting to sell out some of its linear networks, including, of course, the ABC broadcast network. But after that, uh, Bob Iger has kind of walked back the talk on, you know, the sale of the linear networks. And he has to be, I think, really careful as he uh, orchestrates uh, any, uh, you know, any sale of, of assets, especially the linear networks. Because, again, remember, they do definitely want to hold on to ESP, and that is a core property for them, a core brand name for them. And most of ESPN's revenue is tied to the linear network. So they need to do it in a very, very careful way. And it's a, it's a very tricky uh, balancing act for, for Bob Iger. And so I think he realizes that he does need to hold on to some of the linear networks for just a little while, little while longer before he can kind of figure out a viable strategy for that entire TV network business. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Bob Iger and some of the challenges he's facing, especially from uh, you know, uh, try and fund management's Nelson Peltz and his proxy fight with the board and, in essence, 
with Bob Iger, uh, his not-so-triumphant return. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, this, I think, is... is uh a little bit of a distraction, I would say, for the company. I mean, yes, we have Nelson Peltz, and and he he does make some fair points um, in in terms of the stock price being very challenged. And, uh, of course, there are a lot of things that Disney has to do, and they have done that. Uh, Of course, one could argue that, you know, it maybe needs to be done even faster and maybe even more needs to be done. But I I don't necessarily see Peltz having articulated anything specific that Disney hasn't already come up with. So he spoke about, most recently he spoke about, you know, bundling ESPN Plus with Netflix. I mean, the Disney bundle is one of the most successful products out there in the streaming market right now. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see what exactly Pels has to offer uh, in terms of suggestions for Disney that you know they haven't already uh, that they're not already working on or they haven't already come up with. But I think otherwise, kind of having him you know lingering and and having this this proxy battle is just an unnecessary distraction for for Disney's management team right now. Yeah, and it keeps going on. There's always something Nelson Peltz has to say. Boy. Um, well, one thing I want to talk to you about, and I don't think you and I, and we, we've talked before, have ever really talked about, is the theme parks, which it, it seems to be just a constant source of income, of revenue, theme parks and cruises. Does it still continue to be the, the cash cow for the company that it has always been? It absolutely does. And this is where, you know, one really has to wonder, you know, if you just kind of look at, at Disney's, uh, you know, income statement, 65% of this company's profits comes from the theme parks. And yet investors continue to obsess over ESPN, continue to obsess over the linear TV networks, um, you know, even though they don't make up such a big portion of, of the company's revenue or profits. And, and so that's kind of really baffling. But anyway, going back to your point, um, you know, parks absolutely are the key growth driver for Disney in the coming years. They're planning to invest about $60 billion in their parks business over the next 10 years or so. And what we've seen is, of course, after the pandemic, we saw this huge rebound in the domestic parks, uh, you know, so much of pent-up demand, continued growth, a lot of cost efficiencies, operating margins touching record high levels. And now what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of tailwinds actually coming from international parks. So, you know, all of them are open and running right now. We've seen price increases implemented across the board. Um, and we're seeing international revenue growth that is extremely strong, as well as, of course, you mentioned the cruise ships. So we have five cruise ships right now for Disney that are in operation. But you have three new cruise ships that are coming on board um, from 2024 through 2026. And so that is going to contribute significantly uh, to the profit of this segment. It just never seems to amaze me how many people will go to those parks and take those cruises. Well, our thanks to Geetha Raghunathan, U.S. media analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. Geetha, thank you so much. Next up on the earnings calendar is Uber Technologies, posting its latest results this coming Wednesday. And for more on what to expect, we welcome Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst Mandeep Singh. Now, Uber has been on a roll. Demand for rides up, food delivery up, its share price more than doubling in the last year. What do you expect to see in its results this Wednesday? Yeah, look, uh, the mobility segment, which is the driver of profitability for Uber and it's driving all the optimism, uh, continues to do very well. We are talking about, you know, above 25 percent growth, and that has been the case uh, for the last three quarters. It's going to be the case in uh, the holiday quarter, the uh, 4Q that we are talking about. And going forward also, I feel Uber mobility has an advantage in the sense it's gaining market share from Lyft, which isn't executing very well, and it's actually struggling in terms of the supply side. So there aren't as many drivers on Lyft's platforms as they are on Uber right now. And we know with marketplaces, supply growth really makes a difference. If your supply growth keeps up with demand, that's very healthy for the marketplace. So net-net mobility should continue to do well even in 2024, even though the comps get tougher. Now, is this a return of the business consumer, people going back to work, needing rides? All around. I, I think the thing about Uber is uh, because they are a verb and, you know, they have that 150 million monthly active users, they cater to both airport rides, which are more business rides, but also the consumer rides where people are just uh, using that more and more. And uh, for a while, there was this uh, kind of expectation that with inflation, People are going to cut back on the rides because there is that elasticity when it comes to, you know, prices going up, 
people will take fewer rides. What that has done is really helped the inflationary aspect has helped Uber onboard more drivers on the platform. So in a sense, it's uh, brought down the prices for Uber rides because their supply growth has been so good and uh, people need supplemental income. And Uber is one of the best platforms out there if you want uh, to work for two hours, you can yeah. earn decent money. That gig economy really yeah. has boosted these. Now let's talk about uh, something where there is a lot of competition, not just Uber, but food delivery. Mm -hmm. And you're up against some pretty big names when you're uh, Uber Eats. And, and what's the prospect there? What, yeah, so I, I look, I, I think Uber delivery definitely is not, uh, you know, a category leader like the mobility side is. I mentioned how Uber is executing so much better than Lyft on the mobility side. On the delivery side, DoorDash definitely has an advantage in the suburbs. It has had that for uh, a while now, a few years. And what Uber is trying to do is to expand in multiple categories. So they have added grocery, convenience, and all kinds of other uh, delivery uh, that they could uh, tag on to that online food delivery. And to me, the value proposition is a bundle. So Uber uh, has really emphasized their Uber One subscription, which is like mobility plus delivery plus anything, convenience. And it all comes with a 9.99 uh, subscription per month, which is quite attractive. If I had to go for a DoorDash subscription that just does you know, food delivery and grocery delivery or an Instacart subscription, Uber is more attractive because it covers ride sharing as well. So from a bundling perspective, I definitely see the value proposition and it is working. You can see the delivery take rates are getting better because of this bundling aspect and they're layering ads as well on the platform. So the ads is the other uh, kind of profitability driver. That looks like a big growth market, the ads for, for Uber. Yeah, and, and that's where scale matters. For a marketplace like Uber, as long as they maintain the scale through the supply acquisition I mentioned, as well as you know the bundling and the frequency of rides, they have an inherent advantage over all the smaller players. Thank you very much. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst Mandeep Singh. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, we head to Europe for a look at upcoming earnings from several energy giants and the possible impact of the Israel-Hamas war is having on the industry. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, a major holiday kicks off this coming week and what that could mean for China's economy. But first, after Shell kicked off earnings season for the European oil majors, we'll be focused on Total Energies and BP in the coming days. Apart from their financial performances, questions remain about how the industry will respond to growing efforts to meet net zero targets and ongoing disruptions in the Middle East. For more now, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Stephen Carroll. Tom, the big oil companies have spent much of the past four years grappling with existential problems from geopolitics to climate change. Record losses during the pandemic turned into record profits two years later. Activist investors have come and gone. Big Oil's post-pandemic playbook has been simple. Take cash from rising oil prices and hand it right back to shareholders. The challenge this earnings season is to avoid missing expectations. But crude prices were down 20% in the final three months of last year. So that's easier said than done. In Europe, Shell kicked off the season with a big beat on adjusted net income, coming in a billion dollars higher than had been expected. Add to that another three and a half billion dollars of share buybacks. Here's what the Shell CEO, Wael Sawan, told Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie about the company's plans for further returns to shareholders. What we've guided to is 30 to 40 percent of our cash flow from operations coming, uh, coming back to shareholders, so shareholder distributions. Um, what we saw in 2023 is we were slightly above the higher end of that range at 42%. As we continue to deliver the strategy, the whole point and the whole focus of the strategy is creating more free cash flow per share. So we will continue to, to stay within the 30 to 40% or thereabouts through the cycle. 
but continue to create the capacity to be able to reward our shareholders as we have done in 2023 and as we hope to continue to do in 2024. OK, so you have the cash flow, you have the balance sheet. Many would look at that and say you are ready, you are primed for more M&A activity. Do you expect to be more active this year when it comes to mergers and acquisitions? Our focus is very much on delivering the first sprint that we announced. We are uh, essentially just over two quarters into what is a 10 quarter sprint. And what we have identified is that actually a, the largest value op opportunity for us uh, is in just unlocking the full potential of this company. Uh, and so while we will continue to look at bolt-ons to our current portfolio, we expect to stay within the 22 to $25 billion uh, capex range that we have guided to. Uh, and we will continue to look at preferentially going after buybacks because if I'm honest with you, Tom, the most attractive mm. opportunity to allocate capital to in the sector, I think right now, is to buy back our shares at north of 15 percent free cash flow yield. Uh, and that is uh, with a company that is actually building the momentum that we have. It's not a bad buy for us. And that's why we're focused on on ourselves from now. OK, let me get your view on the on the oil price. We've seen gains in oil of about 7 percent through the month of January. There is this tension, it seems, between the demand question, whether that's softening and the geopolitics. How do you see that evolving in the months and quarters ahead? What we see at the moment is the market is well supplied. Uh, the demand has been remarkably resilient in 2023, despite multiple headwinds. The supply side is the bigger question at the moment. Questions around OPEC cohesion. Um, questions around how sanctions might play up. Uh, you'll have picked up, of course, uh, potential increase of sanctions against Venezuela and Iran, uh, potential enforcement or tightening the enforcement of sanctions against Russia. Um, all of that, I think, is, is raising questions around the supply side, not to mention the slight slowdown in the, in the growth of the shales patch. All of that, I think, is just creating a bit more of tightening in the overall market, and we'll see how that plays out. But a lot of it will be based on geopolitics more so than anything else at the moment. The, the gas trading desk, once again, knocking it out of the park, doing very well, putting a very good performance in. Is there anything that derails the strength that's coming through from the gas trading team? Uh, I think a, the Q4 was indeed uh, an exceptional quarter for our trading and optimization organization. We saw the opening of east-west arbs uh, through the quarter, and we had length, as we typically do in the northern hemisphere winters. Uh, and that allowed us to take, to take those opportunities and create real value. What you have seen so far this year at the start of, uh, of 2024 is the the ARBs aren't as wide as they were, so less uh, less running room there, uh, and, and prices have come down. Uh, I think with fundamentals being reasserted now as you, you see a better storage balance in places like Europe and Asia uh, and a milder winter. How do you see the LNG outlook or demand outlook kind of evolving and changing? as well, given that economies, growth is slowing, rates remain relatively high, the inventories are well filled here in Europe. How, what, what does the picture look like in terms of that demand for LNG? So far, we're in balance from what we see. But the, the biggest the determinant of, uh, of demand growth, I think, will come from China and how China responds through 2024. Uh, early signs are, are positive. Uh, while China uh, hasn't uh, essentially fulfilled what uh, some people had expected coming out of COVID, they continue to grow and we see the LNG growth, LNG import growth continue, in particular at these uh, lower prices now that they are able to, uh, uh, to buy at these levels. And so that's going to be a big mm. determinant. What's, what's uh, I think, key in 2024 is there isn't a lot of new supply coming into the market. And so as you go back into stock refilling after the winter, I suspect you'll see robust demand. So for the, for the coming year, year and a half, I think there'll be some good demand. I think one thing to keep in mind on the, in the medium term is China, again, will draw a lot of gas. Um, to give you a sense of that, just in 2024 and 2025, the volume of natural gas power generation capacity that China is building is equivalent to the entire installed capacity in the UK today. Uh, and that's just China, China's build out. So there will be a, a lot okay. of demand for energy. What, what, is your, what is your reaction to this decision by the Biden administration to pause the build out, the licenses, the approvals for, for export facilities, LNG export facilities in, in the U.S. What's your reaction? To, does it put any of your investment plans in the U.S. at risk? I, I think the short, medium term, uh, there will be very little impact to the LNG markets. What it does is it undermines confidence, I think, in the longer term. 
uh, when it comes to U.S. LNG, which is which is a real shame, given the the world uh, demand for LNG is going to continue to grow, and the U.S. is the largest uh, supplier of LNG today. So, a, a pause like this can can always create more uncertainty, in particular when you're looking at long-term investments. Um, that and, for example, uh, the behavior of Venture Global in the U.S. to uh, not honor the contracts towards its off-takers, all of that just undermines confidence in U.S. LNG at a time when the world, including here in Europe, really need the stability of LNG supplies. That's Shell's CEO, Wael Sawa, and speaking to Tom McKenzie, discussing some of the big issues facing the sector as we look ahead to the next set of results in the coming days from BP and Total Energy. Very interesting to hear his comments on the Biden administration's move to pause approving new LNG export facilities. That's something that came up at an industry gathering in Florence in recent days as well, the Baker Hughes annual conference. This year's theme was energising change, addressing themes of affordability and sustainability. Our energy reporter, Laura Hurst, was there. I've been speaking to her about the atmosphere at the conference and whether she felt it was an industry that was ready for change. Well, certainly there was quite a lot of buzz around uh, LNG, hydrogen and other new uh, new low carbon fuels. Uh, but there was not much love for, for the Biden administration's announcement last Friday that said that there'd be a moratorium on LNG exports. So, a lot of backlash there in the room and basically a lot of a lot of gas producers there saying this is the transition fuel that we need and this is well it's going to replace coal so it essentially criticizing the administration for what looks like a political move Yes, yeah, so plenty of focus on, on those policy shifts and how they're affecting this sector as well. When we think about the reporting that we've had from Shell around their earnings, is that a strength that we're likely to see in this earnings season across the sector as we're looking ahead to the next set of oil majors reporting? Well, it really depends which company you're looking at. So, for example, Shell, much of their beat was thanks to their gas trading. They had a what the CEO called an exceptional quarter on gas trading. And Shell's peers like BP have quite a big uh, big trading unit as well, so it could be reflected there. But there are a lot of uh, other areas which aren't looking so bright. So, for example, chemicals. Chemicals for Shell uh, was down almost by a billion dollars. Exxon, they've got a very big chemical unit. So we're likely to see weakness there. So it's a bit patchy. And of course, in general, commodity prices are softer than they were this time last year. How are these companies, when we think more broadly, adapting to the energy transition as well, Laura? This is something that we look out for details of, of how it affects their business when we get earnings updates. But I'm keen, given that you've been having those conversations at the Baker Hughes conference as well, as you're reading as where the industry is now. Well, so you've got on the one hand uh, the American majors like on Chevron, who pretty much for the last few years have, have stuck to their guns of oil and gas, saying this is what we're good at, and we're not going to, you know, go into offshore wind because that's where we're going to make money, and that's not where our competency lies. Now, Shell and BP, they both kind of went down the renewable route, but um, have pivoted back to oil and gas as of late. So there's definitely a retreat there. Total Energy is probably the one that has a a little more um, of a footing in the renewable side with quite a big focus on on power generation, as well as having a very big uh, footprint in the LNG market. One of the other factors that these companies are all having to deal with as well as disruption to shipping in the Red Sea. How much is that a factor that we should be watching out for as we continue to look through the season of earnings results? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's an important choke point. At the moment, the industry is managing that they're, they're shipping around the Cape or rather the Horn of Africa. And and so at the moment, it, it's kind of being managed. And while Tawan, the CEO Shell, said they're also looking at other things like swapping tankers from one region to another. So at the moment, it's manageable, but it's definitely something that could overspill into the wider region and could be become more of a problem. This is something, of course, we'll, we'll continue to be looking for details of in these earnings reports as well. As, as we look ahead to, you've, you've mentioned BP and some of the, the sort of factors we'll be watching in their results as well. When it comes to Total Energy or, or other majors in the sector too, what are the other themes that you're going to be watching for as we get the next set of results? 
Well, definitely anything that uh, talks to demand because demand is looking a little bit weaker at the moment. We saw that again this morning from Shell's results that product results were a lot softer than, than they were a few quarters ago. So that's something that we'll definitely be looking out for. And on gas demand, you know, we've had since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, gas has obviously had some very volatile quarters. And so far this winter has been quite soft. We, we've had a mild winter, so and inventory levels in the in Europe were quite full. That's our energy reporter, Laura Hurst. And of course, we will have full coverage of those next set of earnings from the big oil companies, BP and Total, next week on Bloomberg Radio. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Stephen. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, the Lunar New Year kicks off at the end of the week. Could the holiday usher in a new wave of consumption? I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. The year of the dragon is upon us. The Lunar New Year falls on Saturday, February 10th. But it's the pre-festival spending patterns that will give some hints to the state of China's economy. And for a preview, we turn to Daybreak Asia co-host Doug Krisner, who spoke with Shirley Zhao, Bloomberg News reporter in Hong Kong. Tom, the travel rush for the Lunar New Year holiday or Spring Festival has already started. A key question is whether Chinese consumers are confident enough to give a much-needed boost to the domestic economy. For a closer look, we're joined by Bloomberg's Shirley Zhao, who covers Chinese conglomerates, including companies focused on consumers, gaming, and telecommunication. Shirley, thanks so much for taking time to chat with us. I want to begin with the fact that as we enter the Year of the Dragon, I'd like to know a little bit more about the Year of the Dragon. What is it known for? Well, actually, the Year of the Dragon is supposed to be a year of particularly good luck in China. So you'll see more babies being born and you'll see people... uh, typically spending more than usual in the year of the dragon. So um, there is expectation that the recovery this year would be faster than last year. So uh, travel, as we know, is obviously a big part of the story when it comes to celebrating and being with family and friends. Are the expectations pretty high this year? Um, Well, I think for domestic travel in China, the expectation is certainly high because we've seen last year, even though, you know, China's economy was slowing down and people's spending power has declined and the consumer sentiment wasn't that good. Travel was really one of the bright spots in China last year. So the expectation is that the trend will continue this year. Uh, People, you know, because they don't want to spend on any big ticket items and uh, the demand for international travel is just starting to pick up, but still pretty weak. Uh, So people tend to, you know, seek um, entertainment and leisure for uh, during domestic travel. Yeah, the the most recent data that we had on the PMI services uh, for China showed a bit of an improvement. It was small, but it may have been kind of a leading indicator that people are expecting some of the services industries to do well during the the holiday period. Is that a fair statement? Yes, services industry, especially experience. Uh, led activities. For example, last year we saw the box office doing quite well and we saw people typically spending on food and drinks, uh, like they're buying beer, going to restaurants, they're going to second tier or third tier cities for barbecue. Mm. And uh, yeah, people tend to, I think, during an economic slowdown when the outlook is still not very certain for a lot of people, they tend to splash out on, you know, just instant gratification activities. So when you look at things like ticket prices or movie tickets, are prices generally higher than they were a year ago? Well, definitely, if you, you know, by China standards, uh, movie ticket prices in China now would be higher than a few years ago. But the increase isn't that much. And generally, ticket prices in China is still fairly low. For example, we're talking about 50 yuan for seeing a movie. That's why a lot of people from Hong Kong, which is neighboring, you know, some mainland Chinese cities like Shenzhen, a lot of people are going to Shenzhen to watch movies because it's so cheap. 
When we looked at the latest activity data for the month of December, I think the unemployment rate was around 5%. So has there been an urge uh, among companies in the services industry to bring back workers now, at least on a temporary basis? I think the demand is certainly picking up. Um, and I think the reason why we've seen a lot of Hong Kong people going to Shenzhen to shop and spend on entertainment partly is because the service industry there performs much better than in Hong Kong. Um, and I've heard that that's because because there, because there were a lot of layoffs. Mm. Uh, the youth unemployment was pretty high. So people just went to Shenzhen and started their started up, up their own businesses like street food stalls um, and restaurants uh, are able to hire younger employees and they typically are more creative and they you know provide better services to customers and that's one of the reasons uh, why a lot of Hong Kong people uh, who are used to the sort of subpar service quality in Hong Kong because, you know, it's a very cutthroat, very mm. fast-paced city, they feel that the service quality in Shenzhen is much higher. So they all flock to Shenzhen to, to shop and, and to entertain themselves. Surely one of the other destination points that I think of is Macau, obviously gaming, a big part of that story. Uh, how do you think the, the gaming companies, the casinos will do this year during the holiday period? Well, last year for casinos, it was a great year. So People sort of expected, you know, the recovery would do quite well, but actually the performance of Macau casinos exceeded uh, the, the expectation. And I think it's because Macau is shifting to attract more, you know, mass market tourists after Beijing's crackdown on the VIP gamblers. So we saw casinos hosting more concerts and more conferences and more sports events to draw in a lot of people to Macau. And this year, I think the growth will sort of start to stabilize, uh, maybe because the pent-up travel demand among Chinese to Macau could slow down at a certain point of the year. And also, you know, casinos uh, typically are spending more to attract these people. So their earnings may, you know, the growth may not be as fast as last year. But generally, I would say sentiment-wise, it's still quite good. People are still going to Macau to see concerts, and then they may just, you know, drop by casinos to gamble and um, shop luxury. So I think so far, I see Macau is still on the recovery track. Well, that's a great transition because I want to talk about gift giving next. Traditionally, aren't the red envelopes given? And that's just basically giving cash, right? You're not giving an item. Yes, so that's a you know long time Chinese New Year tradition. So people just put very new, newly either iron them or you go to bank for new banknotes mm -hmm. and you put them in the red packets and you give it to your security guards, to your relatives, to any people senior, uh, more junior to you like, you know, children of your relatives. So for friends and family members, and if you wanted to spend a little bit more money and you were interested in giving, let's say, a particular item, whether it was a luxury good or, or something else, do you have a sense of kind of the price range that the average person would spend uh, giving a gift to a family member? Is it less than $50 U.S.? I would say it would be more than $50 U.S. Okay, and how might they spend that? Might they buy uh, a device of some kind? Might it be a piece of technology or a piece of clothing? How would the average consumer go about choosing a gift? We saw the general trend last year is that people just sort of, you know, they prefer to uh, spend on uh, less expensive items, uh, and they didn't spend as much on luxury items as before. So we've seen like a decline in spending over, for example, jewelry, uh, high fashion clothing, handbags. Um, and these are actually not for traditional Chinese New Year gifting as well. So uh, for Chinese New Year gifting, I would say really people would spend more on uh, the sort of healthcare products mm. and medicine um, and, you know, dried seafood. These are more like um, preferred by Chinese families. 
So the other question then that I have would be, how do you acquire these goods? Is it going to a brick and mortar, a physical store, or is a lot of commerce being conducted online? A lot of commerce would be conducted online. So in China, e-commerce is everything. That's why we've seen a lot of luxury brands. They, even though they want to maintain their very high-end, exclusive image, they have to set up shops on some of China's biggest e-commerce platforms because they know that's the best access to Chinese consumers. Especially after COVID, you know, during COVID, people just did everything. On Online and delivery in China is so fast and convenient. If you order, for example, at 10 a.m. this morning, it's likely that your products will be delivered by noon. So、um, people just find it so convenient, and you can find everything online. So e-commerce is really a dominating force in China. That's why you've seen a lot of the mid-range or low-range shopping malls in decline. So if you go to China, chances are that you will see some、mm, shopping malls that have no people in,、mm-hmm. and sometimes you know maybe the lights aren't on because nobody's going. One of the things that's popular here in the U.S. around holiday time and gift giving. Uh, gift cards, where the gift giver doesn't actually have to purchase an item; they simply purchase a card with a dollar or value that they can give the recipient, and then the recipient would in turn、uh, decide what they want to purchase with with that card. Is that way of of gift giving popular at all, or is is there the kind of the obligation to come up with a gift、uh, per se? I think the red packets would really cover a lot of that. So as as we discussed just now, cash giving is a big thing, and particularly nowadays in China, cash giving on social media, for example, WeChat is one of China's biggest social media platforms. It's actually got a virtual red packet giving. Um, service, so you can just you know send your relative or your friends ten、uh, bucks、mm. or one hundred or even one thousand. Wow!、Um, yeah, and you can spend you know, and they can spend anything. Shirley, before I let you go, can you just tell me, share with me how you're planning to spend the holiday? Are you planning to travel? Yes, I do. I'm planning to go back to mainland China, where my parents live. And when you get together with them, what what's kind of the typical way that the family would celebrate the Lunar New Year? Uh, so first, we would just have a big dinner,、um, and we would watch this, you know, annual. It's a big tradition, annual Spring Festival gala、uh, organized by state media.、Um, the quality of which I would say has been in decline、uh, every year, and the younger generation are, you know, starting to、uh, not want to watch it anymore. But Out of filial piety and out of family duty, because your parents are all watching, that you have to watch with them. Shirley, thank you so much for helping us preview the Lunar New Year festivities. It's the Year of the Dragon coming up. Shirley Zhao covers a Chinese conglomerates, including companies focused on consumers, gaming, and telecommunications. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself weekdays here for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, beginning at 9 a.m. in Hong Kong, 8 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom. Our thanks to Doug and Shirley, and that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on the markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. <laughs>